biggest, uh, most memorable investigations of the last few years was the University of Illinois scandal, the admission scandal that came off the beat, came off of the higher ed reporter, um, finding a story, identifying it, fighting for that story, getting the resources to do it right and bringing about great change. I think that's a great example of what you see every day. So um, what I'll start with here is, is sort of a very simple question with each of these reporters, which is to talk about their most recent projects, um, and they have kind of said they all great years. Uh, the last year has been really rewarding for this team. Talk about their most recent project and how they came up with the idea and uh, why we decided to pursue that. So I'll start with Gary, which was Fugitive Food Justice. Okay. Um, I think as, as George mentioned, ideas are really everything. Coming up with a project idea, perhaps the, mo the most difficult thing to do for an investigative reporter is finding the right idea and being, being able to execute it. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Fugitive from Justice Project, but essentially it's a project in which we, um, we uh, look at individuals who committed very serious crimes here in the Chicagoland area. We're talking about murders, sexual assaults, crimes against children, and then they fled the country, they fled overseas. Many of them went to Mexico, but we traced people to South Korea, to India, and to other countries. And the genesis of this really dates back to the mid-1990s. At the time, I was um, covering 26 in California, the criminal courthouse building, and I don't know if you remember, but the Tribune did a series called um, Killing Our Children. And then it was really followed all of the young, it followed the cases of all young individuals who were juveniles who had been killed during that year. And we did a follow-up series called, what was it called, Saving Our Children? Or, yes. We really looked into what happened to the perpetrator. Was justice served, and if so, and if so, how? If not, why not? And I was assigned this story, um, and it's, and, you know, obviously I've never forgotten it. It involved an individual named Saul Aguado. And he was a, an immigrant from Mexico who came to Chicago with his family, and he had been charged and convicted of killing his infant son. His infant son was actually in a, in a uh, you know, a, um, uh, an infant seat, and the baby would not stop crying, and according to, um, you know, court documents, he had gotten angry and essentially threw the child across the room. The child hit his head, and he died. Saul Aguado pleaded guilty to that crime, and it was between his uh, guilty plea and his sentencing, he was out on bond, he fled the country. And my job was to find Saul Aguado if I could. And so I spent the next couple months tracing him from Hawaii, from Chicago to Hawaii, and then all the way down to a small village in Guanajuato, Mexico. And I was able to find Saul Aguado, interview Saul Aguado, I published that story, and after it was published, he was eventually brought back to Chicago, he was extradited, and is now serving 60 years in Menard Prison. And I sort of, you know, after that, then I went to South America for four years, and then I went to Cuba for five years, but I always sort of kept that idea in the back of my head. How common was the solid water storm? How frequent is it that individuals commit crimes, serious crimes, and then flee the country because they're out on bond, or do they flee the country before they're even charged? So I kept that in the back of my mind, and uh, myself and David Jackson, you know, one of the finest reporters in the country, sort of decided when we were in between projects, let's look at that. Let's look and see how common it is. And that was the genesis of the Fugitive from Justice series. Jason, why don't you explain a little bit about what you've done on pensions the last year? Sure, so for the past uh, year and a half, two years, I've been working on a series of stories dealing with Illinois and Chicago's uh, pension crisis. Uh, right now, the state of Illinois has unfunded pension liabilities that are at about $85, $83 billion, depending on where you ask. And the city of Chicago's uh, pension debt right now is upwards of uh, $20 billion. And we actually got on this story originally back in 2010, uh, mainly because a few uh, reports and other things started bubbling up uh, from the news in terms of uh, Chicago's sort of crushing debt and the state's crushing debt. And so, you know, as we fish around for stories of uh, being uh, an investigative team and having a little bit more time to work, Sometimes we do enterprise stuff that we sort of come up with based on uh, past experience, like Gary just said. And other times, you know, I guess this one would be an investigation that sort of played off the news. 
So, you know, pensions were a big issue in the state. Weren't such a big issue in the city, wasn't getting quite the kind of attention uh, that the state was getting. And so I decided uh, to try to pitch a story uh, to look deeper at Chicago's pension issues. And the result was, uh, you know, we started looking at how the city got to the place where it is today. And that sort of took us into some of the laws that have been written up over the years and how much of this is manipulated through the state legislature. We sort of tracked, you know, what happened to the city. We looked a little bit at investments. And then I went off and did another project for a couple of months and we got a call from some of our colleagues over at WGN who had received a tip from a union member uh, who was very upset because some of his leaders uh, were receiving both a public pension uh, from the city of Chicago and also receiving private pensions uh, from the union as well as uh, private pension credits from the union and uh, very high union salaries as you know, being union leaders. And this individual you know, brought us a few documents to show kind of where they were at. And from there, uh, my colleagues at WGN, Mark Sapelsa and uh, Mark Bartel and I, sort of went down this road. And because I had experience with the pension system, um, I was able to sort of uh, navigate how this was able to happen. And what we found out was just the extent to which the laws of the state of Illinois were manipulated to benefit a handful of people uh, and at the same time shortchange the funds themselves. So that today uh, we find ourselves uh, at a crossroads where taxpayers are going to be asked to provide more resources to the pension fund, rank and file workers are going to be asked to give back benefits or to pay more for benefits. Um, and the system itself still isn't really on track. So, you know, it's still a huge question. Uh, and the one thing we were able to find, though, as I mentioned, was, you know, time and again, these laws were being manipulated. So we went back and we were finding all this legislation, some of which, you know, one piece of legislation said, if you're a union official and you worked for the city at some point during your career, you could continue to participate in the City of Chicago Pension Fund, but that pension would be based off of your union salary. So we had union officials who worked, for example, for the Department of Streets and Sanitation. They were making maybe $45,000, uh, $45,000 a year. But then they would retire from the city 20 years later on a union salary of, say, $200,000 and they would get 70% of that and then continue to work as a union uh, leader and then continue to recruit benefits as a union leader. So we had certain members, uh, certain union officials who were collecting two pensions for the same time period of work. That's both ethically wrong, uh, it's also not the way pension funds were to be structured. And the benefits that these guys were getting were over and above what you would consider a modest benefit. We had one individual who until Mayor Daly retired was the, lar uh, the highest paid annuitant in the city of Chicago. He was receiving about $156,000 a year. Uh, his name was Dennis Gannon, he was the former president of the Chicago Federation of Labor. And he was receiving about $150,000 while he was also making about $250,000 salary from the, uh, the labor, uh, Chicago Federation of Labor. So this creates very uh, awkward situations where you have a member of a labor organization who's negotiating contracts with the mayor who allowed him to receive these benefits. And so once we kind of saw that what was happening with the labor officials, we said, you know, we also want to look at some of the lawmakers and city officials who, uh, who allowed some of these deals to go through. And as we went back again, we started with the law, because this is where everything is laid out. And we found that, for example, when Mayor Daly first came to the office in 1991, he, one of his first things that he did on the pension fund was provide aldermen with uh, pension benefits that are far higher than your average worker. So an alderman in the city of Chicago now gets 80% of their final salary as opposed to 70%, which is what other people get uh, based on an average salary of about four years. And so once again, the result of that is we have aldermen that are retiring with higher benefits as, as a retiree than what they actually make when they were serving in office. This, we found the same thing uh, with the state legislature. I think our main example there was uh, former Senate President Emile Jones, who now makes, I think it's about $60,000 dollars more in retirement than he made as president of the Senate. Um, and these costs will continue to go up. I mean, I could go on and on with the stories. 
But uh, the bottom line is, you know, sort of the, the the you know, thesis or whatever was that these laws were being manipulated, and we tried our best to show, sort of show how that was happening. And so right now, you know, there's movement afoot to try to fix the pension system. There are no easy uh, answers here. There will be pain for everyone. And so, of course, the legislature wasn't able to pull a deal together uh, before the end of this past session. So we'll see what they do in the fall. So obviously, one of our uh, themes with our investigations is to try and connect with our local audience. We want to, we feel that's our most important and highest goal. Uh, but you can kind of already see a little bit of the range of ways we do that. Here with pensions, you have a very intensely local story that affects everybody's taxes. Uh, you can go to the city of Chicago and be outraged. You can just be a member, uh, a member of Illinois citizen and see what's going on and see how you're affected. Uh, with Fugitives from Justice, you had what was really sort of an international tale, one that, that took us to Mexico, included um, some reporting in Asia and elsewhere, and, uh, and we were willing to go that, that extra, put that extra effort in to make that work. With uh, what Sam worked on last year, um, and published just recently, uh, the Flavor Carton series, Playing with Fire, you see a national story. It's not a story that grows out of somebody being hurt or injured in Illinois or legislation even in Illinois. The key legislation in this issue is actually in California and uh, there are, it's also a federal issue. But this is an issue that affects everybody in our leadership, everybody in America, and it was something we, we felt was worth throwing some of our best people at. We ended up having um, Sam Rowe, Patricia Callahan, and eventually our uh, excellent environmental reporter, Mike Hawthorne, worked on it. So Sam, why don't you talk a little bit about that story? Yeah, Flamer Tarts was really interesting to me when I first got into it, because I didn't realize that we had Flamer Tarts in everyday products in your living room, for instance. We had it in your couch, we had it in love seats, a book furniture, TVs, uh, some drapes, some carpets. Um, and, and, you know, it's a chemical that are embedded. And it's not measured by parts per million or parts per billion. It's in your pouches by ounces and pounds. So there's a lot in your average house that have that much flavor carbon, which would be all fine and dandy if the flavor carbon's work was advertised. They slow the fire, they protect protective lives. Uh, but what we found is they don't. And another negative high side effect is that the flame retardants can break down and particles can get out of your house. They can migrate as dust around your house. You can absorb it through the skin, especially kids. Kids, you know, touch dust and then put their hands in their mouth and they can absorb it. And these chemical flame retardants have been linked to cancer, neurological deficits, um, developmental delays. And so when we start learning this, it was really interesting that because first, I didn't even know flame retardants existed in my home in these products. Two, I didn't know they were linked to all these, these health issues. Um, and the third thing that we found really surprising, maybe not so much surprising, but it, was, it, was, it became good journalism, is that um, it didn't happen by accident. I don't think you know the industries made mistakes or a lot of people you know, were just this well-intentioned mistake. It didn't, it didn't happen that way. That what we learned through a lot of um, looking at documents and, and legwork was that over the last couple of decades, it's been a real calculated and cunning campaign by some of the biggest industries in this company, the chemical industry and big tobacco, to load your furniture in your homes with these chemicals that don't do any good and actually do harm. And so when we start piecing that together, and it took a long time, it's been a best way, it, you know, it really, we felt like it had a lot of elements. You know, it was really consumer-oriented. It showed some of the misconduct by industry. Um, and it became a very enjoyable, somewhat difficult story to, to, to work on. And how it came about is we didn't start out thinking let's look at flame retardants. My partner and I, Chris Callahan, we were both interested actually in pesticides and other chemicals that are, far, that are found far in far flung places in the world, like in, in polar bears in the Arctic or in seals in the South China Seas. And we started learning about that, and you know, that's well documented. But we started asking sort of a bigger question. Why is that happening? I mean, who's responsible? Why, why do polar bears in the Arctic have all these like toxic chemicals in their body? And why is that rising? And when we started doing the research and asking questions, a lot of the past led back to flame retardants. The flame retardants were some of the most persistent organic pollutants out there, and ones that really had this interesting, almost epic story of uh, industry misconduct. And so, you know, 
were two reporters working on similar topics and then came together and decided that flame retardants we were going to focus on. So one of the things we shoot for, uh, obviously, is to connect with readers, to um, make sure that how we write these complicated stories makes sense, that the readers find them relevant, uh, that they find them surprising. We also, if all goes well, oftentimes see results in the real world, that because of the work we do, investigative work, that things change. So I'd like to just ask each of you to sort of briefly go through what you've seen so far with your most recent pieces. With, with Sam, I know Flame Retardants just got published. There hasn't been, there's been a lot of reaction. There hasn't been laws changed yet, but you've also produced work that has uh, produced changing law. Gary, why don't you talk about how, how government and, uh, and others responded to fugitives? Well, I mean, I think um, it began sort of at the top with the U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder. After our series was published, um, uh, he was sort of confronted by Dick Durbin in the Judiciary Committee hearing, and he and uh, he kind of recounted our series, and, and uh, the Attorney General said that what we found was unacceptable. And so uh, one thing we found was that, is that, is that family members of these fugitives were actually helping the fugitives escape justice, and that Illinois is one of the few states in the country where you cannot, a family member cannot be prosecuted for doing that. So since our series was published, that loophole was closed. It's now awaiting the governor's signature so that if a, if a uh, father or if a mother or if a brother or somebody like that, over 18 years old, helped a fugitive, wanted for murder or something like that, help them flee the country, they could now be prosecuted. Um, also, there is, there is federal legislation pending that would uh, provide millions of dollars to try to beef up um, the fugitive, uh, try, the sort of the fugitive task force to try to find these fugitives overseas and, and bring them to justice. But I mean, I really think that in this case, um, the power of the series and the reaction is not, was not based on legislation. For me and for David, it was talking to the family members of the victims. I mean, you can imagine, um, and I'm thinking of one case in particular where a Hampton freshman college student was back here in Chicago with some friends, and this was in the, uh, in the early 1990s. It was traveling around in Chicago, got lost, and he stopped at a street corner and a gang member opened fire and killed him. And, and the family was told by law enforcement that there was nothing they could do. That this individual who was wanted for, for the homicide of their son was in Mexico and there's nothing they could do. And David and I went to Mexico and found the guy. And you can imagine the phone call and the reaction of the parents when we told them that. It was outrage that the FBI, that Chicago police and others had basically used no effort, had basically given up because this guy had supposedly fled to Mexico. And here, two of us, without guns and badges, using basic investigative techniques, could go down and find them. And so when I, when I look at investigative reporting and the power of investigative reporting, it's very simple. In this case, it was trying to bring justice and closure to the wounds that these family members had faced and had suffered. Jason has yet to a proper complete fix of pensions in Illinois. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> but uh, there have been some things that have changed as a result of your work. So, um, uh, yeah, we, we've had uh, the legislature uh, throughout our series have passed a number of laws to try to shore up uh, some of the funds and end some of the most egregious abuses. So our first uh, series back in after, uh, I think it was 2010, the end of 2010, uh, at the end of that session they passed a law that said basically the city of Chicago would be required to contribute um, the actuarial required amount to the police and fire pension funds. 
Right now, the Chicago Police Department and the Chicago Fire Department, their pension funds are among the lowest in the city. I believe the police fire department fund is somewhere in the 30s or low 30s, and the police department is fund is somewhere in the, in the high 30s. And these are the people that you know risk their lives every day to try to uh, provide safety uh, for all of us. And the fact of the matter is, is their funds are so low that most experts don't believe they're going to last. That eventually they will run out of money, barring some huge uh, influx of, of uh, resources to those funds. And really it says a lot about the management of these funds. When you have people who put their lives on the line and the politicians and uh, city council have been irresponsible in, in funding those over the years, they've dipped into those funds uh, in order to pay for other things and make the budgets look better. And at the same time, have handed out larger uh, benefits to uh, uh, a chosen few. So, um, so we had, that was sort of the first round, and whether or not that law will stay on the books will be interesting to see. I know uh, Mayor Emanuel is not too happy about that law, because again, it's going to suck money from, from his budgets going down the road. But uh, the other thing is they've ended uh, any uh, union officials to be able to uh, receive public pensions based on their private uh, union salaries. They've closed any number of other loopholes. Um, the problem with all of that is while it's really good and, and the lawmakers can come out and say that they've done X, Y, or Z, it's really not fixing the fundamental problem. That fix is politically unpalatable and uh, it's going to require a lot of sacrifice on the parts of everyone, including the workers, the taxpayers, the uh, units of government as well. And so we sort of gathered a lot of steam uh, during the uh, winter and spring session here. Uh, Governor Quinn came out with a proposal that was much greater than he's ever uh, had before and much more forceful. Rahm Emanuel, for the first time in decades, the Chicago mayor went down to testify in Springfield and he did this on pensions and came out with his own plan. And so there are a lot of plans out there and I think the big question now is who's going to come up with the will? Who's going to have the will to sort of push this ball forward so that we save this, these retirement funds for the people that have put into them for so long. And uh, you know, that story, that part of the story hasn't been written yet, so we'll have to wait uh, and see. Thanks, Jason. Sam, I, I know that, um, again, there has been enough time for a lot to happen, except I do think what we've seen is that this issue now is is out there. What, you know, people now are aware of it, whether it's the public at large or the opinion makers and lawmakers. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it does seem like there's really an intense interest in it now. It just seems so silly, even to a layperson, that you have these dangerous chemicals in your couch or in your living room that aren't doing anything. You know, they're not going to do anything unless they get them out. It seems simple. It seems like something that a lot of lawmakers do agree on, but who knows. Um, you know, one of our jobs as reporters is after we spend a long time on a story, six months or a year or whatever, and we have you know, this big project in the paper with these investigative findings, is that afterward, you do have to do a lot of work to, you know, call the people who are accountable and ask them the hard questions, because it's sad to say, but there's a lot of folks who just, you know, in power that just hope this goes away. You know, you write something big and they just hope, well, I think the community's done with this now. And so what we're probably going to be doing for the next few months is calling people up and saying, well, what are you going to do? Or what do you think? Or, you know, and they'll transfer you a few times and you just have to keep going back. But when we do, unless you report it almost, and you guys may agree, it's almost like you're, you're doing two races, you're doing two marathons. You have to put together this big story and come up with investigative findings, but afterwards you really have to keep working on it because sometimes if you don't, nothing will change. And I think we're all into this because we, we want to improve the world and believe in public advocacy journalism. And so you do have to just keep pounding away at the people in power because, you know, sometimes you have to shame them into doing the right thing because, you know, it's politically expedient for them sometimes to do nothing. And so we're going to probably be following this up for the rest of the year, so we're really tripping. We'll hopefully we can some more stories. Thanks. James? You guys have some questions for these guys? I'm going to try to act as a human clock. These are technical issues and, uh, and everybody's very passionate about this stuff, so I'll try to keep things moving on because the shorter the answers, the more the questions. Do you have questions over here? Let's start back here. We're taking tips in the back of the tent, by the way. If you've got tips, come and talk to us, Warren. I'm not kidding. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you run these stories by the people, the organizations that you're going to report on before it appears in the paper? Yes. And the second part is, are there any ramifications or anything that come out of these for you with those decisions? We operate under a uh, philosophy that should be no surprises for the people we're writing about. So uh, if people are willing to talk to us, we are willing to share with them what we found and, and engage them in a discussion about what their point of view is and what else we should be doing. Uh, as well, the ramifications, I mean, I'm not sure what you mean, legal or otherwise? or. I would just say that um, you know that's among the most important things that we do. I think in the business we sort of call them confrontational interviews because you know it's sort of we usually talk to them along the way as well. But there does come a point where we've gathered all of our material, we've done our research, and there comes a time when we sort of have to lay our cards on the table and say, you know, Mr. Daly, what, you know what happened here with this pension? You know, you applied for it at this point. You know, walk through them our findings and give them an opportunity to say you're wrong about this or you didn't take this into account and that's incredibly important for us because we don't want to put anything in the paper that's not accurate so often not oftentimes but there will be times when there will be something maybe that we haven't considered or some aspect of something uh, that, that doesn't present itself you know right away and, and we will adjust the story accordingly so it, it's an important thing to do yeah, I've got a broader picture of question. It seems that this kind of tailored to the story stuff, especially given the reality of media and the reality of newspapers getting smaller and smaller and smaller, money coming less and less and less for the sort of journalism. The idea of doing this kind of tailored to the story thing, I'm saying, wait a minute, is that the best way to do this? Is there something like something that is a watchdog before the burglar gets in the house? The preemptive strike? Yeah. Well, I think that's, you know, I think that's part of our, of what else, but the, the other work we do, which is our daily beat report, so that the people who are in Springfield, or as I mentioned, who are covering higher ed, that they're catching these things as they're happening. And so you cannot only have people doing projects in a newspaper. You need a newspaper that's geared toward covering the right dates and covering them with an eye toward being a watchdog for the public. So yes, I think there's a lot of that. At the same time, sometimes only by coming back to something can you really figure out what happened. That happened with the pensions. Sorry, Chad. That happened with the pensions as well because we got we had some some people would write us and say, well, why are you uncovering? We write about a law written in 1991. They're like, why are you writing about this now? And the fact is, we did maybe write a story about the law before, but sometimes the ramifications have to be felt before we really understand what's going on. And that that was the case with the pensions. There. Can you tell us some stories about cases you went after that did not come to fruition either because you couldn't get the goods or your editors didn't feel comfortable in publishing them? The lawyers are listening. No. <laughs> we, have, we have lawyers that... I, mean, I would just say that we, we churned through a lot. I mean, the Fugitives from Justice series is ending now, and, uh, and, and we are basically churning through a bunch of ideas now trying to figure out, you know, where can we best put our resources? Is the story big enough for us? How long will it take? I mean, it's a very tricky thing. You obviously don't want to spend six months investigating something when in the end you're going to find nothing. But on the other hand, if it's a short thing, it probably isn't a good enough story and it's probably already out there. So it's an incredibly difficult thing. It's one thing to sit at home and say, man, I wish somebody would investigate that. But you're talking about putting in a lot of resources into this and, and a lot of time. And so it's, it's very difficult to come up with the project that fits the newspaper in which you can investigate something and try to change, try to improve, try to expose something and try to make changes. So it's incredibly difficult to, to do what you're talking about. And if we're running our operation correctly, we're not going to get to the point where somebody's spending months and months and and it's ready to publish something and then it gets stopped. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a process in which 
there's discussion all along the way. So that I'm aware of what David and Gary are thinking about right now as to what their next stories will be. And we'll work together so that we're all on board so you don't have a bad ending that, that might happen. I was uh, reading this story this morning about the Toyota Park um, yeah. you know, investigation. And my question is about Madigan. Why does it seem like he has lasted for so long without being indicted, investigated? when he is obviously, you know, profiting from his speakership in the house. Well, I wish uh, John I think that, that, we'll turn that over to Jerry Kern. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the investigative side, we do what we can with our resources to look at the top leaders in Illinois, and it takes back, you know, uh, so I think we're going to our political uh, investigators and the Tribune did a great job in Illinois, which is doing a great job looking at it. And, the rest of it, we don't know. You know, we're not. I mean, I think as that story pointed out this morning, again, David, uh, Chase, and Kinwell are two reporters who've been on it, done terrific work for the last couple of years. I mean, it doesn't appear that, that, that the speaker has broken any laws. I mean, there are so many loopholes in terms of contracting and conflicts of interest and stuff like that. I mean, up to now, you know, it doesn't appear like he has crossed any line, or at least a line that, 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 that investigative reporters have been able to nail down. I, I would just say this from my work on the pension fund, because Speaker Madigan had a hand in a lot of the laws that we wrote about. I, I think it speaks to the broader issue of how laws are written up in Illinois. Uh, the, the freedom of information uh, laws here are terrible. They're among the worst in the country. And so uh, I think that that has a direct relationship to the way that our government is run. If you people, and selfishly us up here, cannot get access to basic information about how government works, how are we going to do anything about it? And in the case of Speaker Madigan, the way money is raised in Illinois, the ethics laws for lawmakers, all of these things, just like the pension code, have loopholes and and weird quirks about them that you don't find in other places. And this is the result of having individuals who have been in power for decades. Mayor Daley was the mayor of Chicago for 20 years, and nobody knew how bad the finances of the city were until he left. Speaker Madigan has been running Springfield for 40 years. And we'll see, you know, the state is in terrible financial shape. And, and I just think that all of this has, has a cascading effect and what really needs to happen are individual people need to stand up and start requesting access to government uh, uh, information and have clear rules and guidelines. Yes, uh, uh, so many of these issues, uh, I think of uh, while well, Mayor Daly was in office, so many of these things uh, took place at that time. Yet, as you are doing your current stories, I, I don't think I've ever seen a comment from the mayor about some of these issues. Well, this goes back to the first question of do we go and, you know, why it's important for us to talk to them. We requested on numerous occasions to talk with Mayor Daly. Uh, I even went to his former aide, Timothy Degnan's home and knocked on his door. Uh, it's sort of a, uh, and Speaker Madigan is the same way, they will not talk to us. And that, to me, that says a lot right there. If someone doesn't want to talk, it always, you know, raises a red flag as far as I'm concerned. Because all we're trying to do, again, and the way that we approach when we go to talk to them is we want to get this right. We want to make sure that we're understanding this correctly. It's, we have A plus B equals C. So if we got something wrong here, you know, you need to let us know. And when they don't want to talk, it usually means we got it right. And uh, so it's a real problem. It's part of the political culture here, though. They just, they feel like it's better to put their heads down and wait till we go away and then go on with their business. Uh, I have a question regarding the pensions as well. Do you think the compounding of the COLA is finally going to go away? It seems like it's getting a lot of attention. And the second part, I live in one of the, I think it's 40% of the state, where none of our teachers pay a penny towards their pension. Our school board, meaning the property taxpayers do it. And as I understand it, The first part of your question regarding the COLA, both uh, Mayor Emanuel's proposal and 
Governor Quinn's proposal as well as the legislation uh, that was coming out of Springfield that eventually didn't get enough votes, but we think will come back. All of those proposals uh, seek to either eliminate or greatly ratchet down the poll. So for example, they would get rid of the compound in POLA. It's true that um, many teachers do not actually pay into the pension system. There's something in the laws called a pickup, where the district can actually pick up either the full pension contribution from the employee or a portion of it. Now in the private sector, employees don't pay anything towards their pension, the employer pays it all. So public sector, it's a little bit about benefits are higher, so they're required to pay more. How that changes, I don't know. One of the proposals uh, that's out there now is to shift those costs. So really, the school district where you're from doesn't actually pay the pension costs. The state does. You end up paying through your property taxes one way or the other, whether it comes from the state or it comes from the district. The effect of that is if you live in a small district that pays its superintendent and its teachers relatively reasonable, you're ending up paying for part of Evanston's uh, or part of, you know, Waukegan or whatever, their school districts, you know, superintendent gets $300,000 or whatever. So there's this, one of the proposals is the cost shift everything back from the state to the individual districts to make them responsible for the pension costs. The problem with that is that your taxes probably will be affected if that happens. So again, this is the problem with the pension issue. We're in this pickle and there are, there's no easy way out. Everyone's going to have to suffer a little bit, unfortunately. There are some, there are some occurrences that it's really difficult to pin down one person because it's systemic. And such as, for instance, it's not my opinion, it's a fact that the medical community is worse than negligence. They are maliciously, premeditatively giving license to the corporations to dump chemicals into our drinking water source, Lake Michigan, and then the medical community gives them license by saying it doesn't make anybody sick or give us cancer because it's only so many parts per billion. When Lake Michigan and all freshwater bodies should be unmolested. Uh, maybe I'll take this. Um, I can't address exactly what you're saying, but I do think you raise a, a larger point that there's all these issues out there that are incredibly complex, and the people who sort of control the knowledge, whether it's you know doctors or industry, they, they sort of have that upper hand. And as reporters and the public, it's difficult to sort of figure out whether they're misleading us or distorting the truth unless we can figure out what their arguments are, what the facts are. And I know when we did the Flame Department series or we did the previous series, there is a lot of um, effort in the beginning just to, just to try to figure out what someone's saying. You know, just to try to master the topic to say, so we can come out in the paper and say, no, this scientist is distorting this, the truth of this, or this, this company is, is doing something wrong here, because it's very complex. And it's, again, it's not complex by accident. I mean, they benefit from having complexities in these kinds of issues. And uh, it's a lot to wade through. And when you call up, whether it's you know certain scientists or government officials that deal with this area, I mean, they're, they're not going to spend a lot of time explaining things to lay out a road so you can go out and write a story that's going to negatively affect them. And so one of the challenges we face all the time is in these very complex stories, especially with science, how can we master that topic so we can say, you know, they're doing something wrong? Yeah, they give us Orwellian double talk. I'm sorry? They give us Orwellian double talk. Yeah, yeah, they do. One of the things that I found fascinating about your fire retirement story, because I believe the first one that came out, was the relationship between the tobacco company, and Craig didn't say something about this earlier, the tobacco company, the chemical company, and the State Fire Marshal Association, or whatever it was that was ponied up to support the money return issue. Um, it was very clever by the tobacco industry. What she's referring about is the tobacco industry wanted to shift attention away from cigarettes. Cigarettes were causing all these fires back in the 1970s, right? And the tobacco companies didn't, they were taking a lot of heat for that, so they didn't want to get blamed for that, so they shifted attention. And they said, it's not the cigarettes that are the problem, it's your couch. It's your couch that's going up in flames that's the problem. And so they did a lot of really clever behind-the-scenes lobbying to get everyone to believe that your couch was the problem. And as you mentioned, they enlisted the help of 
the state's top fire official, the number one fire official in every state, the state fire marshal, they helped organize that crew, got them together, and then convinced them to sort of do their bidding, to go out and spread their message that it's not cigarettes in the problem in the world, it's the couch. And that happened years and years ago, but we're still living with that legacy. And that's partly what we wrote about, and maybe partly something that we're
information that they develop, argue for a public policy point of view, and then hopefully uh, encourage you citizens, we citizens, to do something about it. I think that's been a, uh, very much the case uh, over the last uh, three or four years. We have uh, a public agenda that's based on ending corruption, about reforming education, about uh, you know bringing about transparency and responsibility in government. And so a lot of the reporting that you saw about Madigan and the legislature and how things work behind the curtain, we take a very strong editorial stance. So we want you to uh, help us with that, help us by being part of this community that we uh, serve, and then, you know, you have to take it to the ballot box to make it good. Well, you talk about the politicians, but how about the corporations? The corporations pay your salary, just like the corporations pay the politicians' tracks. Hey, uh, you know, I don't believe that we're getting paid by corporations to write the flame of retard series. That was all about the chemical industry and the tobacco industry, and they did not want that story told. And we told it, and we're the only ones in America to do it. That's why we have subscribed to the trip for 40 years because of the 